7 o'clock. We're going to call the meeting back to order. We actually had a session earlier. And we're going to start with um, our salute to the flag, which is back behind it. I'd like to leave you a salute to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Uh, Megan, any correspondence? Um, no. Okay. Uh, Marsha, any public comment? And if people didn't know that they were supposed to sign up, run quickly. No? <laughs> no? Okay. All right, then. Um, the consent agenda. Does anything, anybody have anything to extract? Uh, yes, I'd like to extract... Uh, the, the September 7th special board meeting minutes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Bob. All right. Anything else? Okay, we need a motion to approve the consent agendas. I'll we'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as um, second. Okay. All those in favor? Okay. And Lynn, do you want to let Marsha know what right. the Um. I believe that Emily Melnick was present at the special um, board of education meeting Thursday, September 7th. She's not listed. Now, do we make a motion to accept those minutes as correct? As amended. Yes. As amended. I'll okay. make a motion that we accept the minutes of the <coughs> September 7th Special Board of Education meeting as amended. So, okay. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Okay. Um, I noticed you just came in. Did you sign up for public comment? Because we already passed public comment. Um, for the PTO. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. So you okay, great. All right. Um, all right. So we are on the approval of the 2018-19 meeting dates. And I did have some corrections to that. Um, for 2018, on April 23rd, that's the preliminary budget meeting for the town. Okay. April 23rd. <laughs> what? Oh, I'm sorry. That's no, no, no. Okay, that's okay. There was the preliminary public, there was budget hearing. Consent, right? It was. Yes, consent. that was approved under consent. That's correct. Yeah. Uh -oh. That's okay. Those, those, those are all. Those are all oh. subsets. Do you want to extract that? Yes, can I yes. retroactively extract it? Yes. Okay, sorry. That's okay. So All right. Up through two six was part of the consent. Okay. I'm sorry. That was my fault. So it, it, I just want to make sure people get these on their calendars so that we don't have anybody, you know, missing the meetings. April 23rd is a is the town preliminary budget meeting. So we're going to have to meet on that Tuesday, the 24th, and then. Um, Monday, November 19th is the interfaith service for the town. So we're going to have to meet on Tuesday the 20th. And same thing with 2019, <coughs> just the April date. April 22nd is a preliminary town meeting, or at least it's, I mean, they don't have a schedule out yet for 2019, but it's that, that Monday, it's that third Monday. Okay. So if we can change that to April 23rd. Everything else is okay. So, can we have a motion to approve the... So moved. Uh, okay. I'll second. Okay. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Okay. So if we can get these dates on your calendars, that way, you know, we'll have everybody here for everything. All right, so we're down in reports. All right. The ad hoc SRO committee update, um, you have in your packet the recommendation from the ad hoc SRO committee. Um, so the document just lists all the members of the um, SRO committee, um, the meeting dates, the parent forums. Um, there's just a couple notes. Um, we had very low participation from parents in the forums. We had four forums and we had, in total, about eight parents. 
in the four forums. Um, the staff, we also had two staff um, forums to discuss this. Again, the participation was, was fairly low. Um, in terms of the survey, <coughs> which everybody here I think is familiar with or, or probably got a copy, well, definitely got a copy, there were 279 responses. 62 were staff responses out of 120 um, emails sent to staff. There was 217 out of 1,013 um, emails to parents. Um, and again, that's not individual, that's not families, anybody who submits an email um, to the school. And so there might be two per family, there might be one per family. Um, so we got 217 um, back. Um, and there was no, no clear mandate from the survey. Um, we are going to um, distribute the survey results at another session. The ad hoc SRO committee is going to have a meeting that people can attend if they'd like to, to go over the results of the survey, hear what they are, and then also if they have any questions about um, the SRO's um, committee's recommendation, they can ask those questions. Okay. November 2nd. November 2nd? Okay. Well, that's, that's, our, that's our date that okay. right now we have. We believe that we are ready for the committee members to respond. Okay. But, uh, okay. That's what we're looking at. Okay. So the recommendation from the committee um, has three components to continue the current SRO position, um, an active duty Woodbridge police officer. Um, to continue the SRO coverage um, as it is currently, which is the school year and the summer programs, but to have the summer programs um, support the SRO um, presence for the summer. And there's the summer programs include SEP, REC, um, extended day and then the district does have some programs as well um, the, the scholars and special education thank you okay um, and then the third was um, just again to discuss with the town any sharing that could occur if we didn't have an SRO here the police would be patrolling the school um, on whatever basis they patrol the rest of the town um, so we're you know again um, just a recommendation to go back to the town and see if there's any sharing in the cost of the SRO that could be included under the heading of community policing. Okay. So that's the recommendation from the committee. Any questions? Okay. All right. Um, PTO update. Hi, everybody. I'm just going to use my voice. I think it's yeah. I, 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 we unplug the thing. <laughs> okay. Noise, so. Um, so we met last Thursday to go over plans for the hoop. That's our our big biggest fundraiser for the year, and that's coming up um, Saturday, October 21st at 11:30 in the morning um, until 3:30 in the afternoon. Um, we also just had our first taste test of the year. That was this past Thursday. Children were invited to try black bean and corn salad. At least half the students did try it, and it was really cute because this year we did something a little different where we put it on the wall of the cafeteria, smiley face if you like it, kind of a unhappy face with his tongue sticking out if it was gross and they didn't like it, and they were given stickers, so we had them color-coded for each grade so that they could go and vote on the results. And I believe the sixth graders are going to be compiling the information throughout the year. We have four taste tests that we do with the kids and, you know, make some recommendations to the school lunch. I don't know, but it's, it's, it was really neat to get them to participate actively in it. Uh, I think there were more likes than dislikes, which is really good. Um, so far, the PTO, and, along with RJ Julia Bookstore, have brought in two New York Times best-selling authors to the school. The first grade had um, Ryan Higgins, who was um, the author of the Mother Bruce series. It was a huge hit with the kids. He he's an illustrator and a an author, so he was able to do an illustration based on what the kids kind of yelled out that they wanted. I think it had like a crocodile head and a fish body and bird wings and anyway it was really really neat to see that um, his process and, and see that come alive. 
Um, the fifth and sixth graders had the author and filmmaker Soman, I'm going to kill his name, Shane Nanny. And both grades had um, the opportunity to purchase books, which helped offset the cost of bringing these special guests in. Um, and I believe they both sold them off the charts because they're such popular authors for those age groups. And those uh, authors signed those books for those kids, so that was pretty special. Uh, both kindergarten and first grade socials have happened. Um, second grade social, I believe, is on November 3rd. And the Harvest Hike on October 4th had a great turnout. Um, it was a beautiful afternoon. I know you were able to attend, and it, it was it was lovely. So I, I heard there was some light participation in the past year, so I, I, this year we had some great participation. But right now we are just focused on the hoop. And there's a million things to do to make that a success. So um, that's it. Okay, great. Is there any questions? Any questions? No. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you very much. Yeah. Thank you. All right. You are up, Mr. Gilbert. Okay. Well, just a, again, a thank you to the PTO for all of you for us, and uh, we're all looking forward to this Saturday, even those of, the, those of us who have to get wet in the uh, no. tank, but... Um, it's supposed to get warm again. Thank you. That's, that's good. That's good to hear. Uh, hopefully around 11.30, 12 o'clock. Um, but anyway, so thank you, PTO, and thank you very much for all you do for us. And um, the Harvest Hike was great, and uh, our administrative team was there, and many other staff members, and a lot of parents. It was great compared to last year when we, I think, we got lost in the shuffle, so... We are. So it's a pleasure to welcome our newest board member, Claire Coleman. Claire is here for her first meeting. And uh, Claire was appointed at last week's Board of Selectmen meeting. Um, she's fulfilling Emily Melnick's term. Emily recently resigned um, as a board member, and so uh, we're sad to see Emily go, and we're glad to see Claire here. Um, so, Claire, welcome. Um, our board subcommittees um, are very hard at work. A lot of subcommittee meetings have taken place already. I'm not going to steal the, the thunder of those committee chairs as they talk a little bit later in the meeting about what's been going on, but I'd like to thank everybody for the extra meeting time that they've been spending in those important areas. Um, we had a great, an, uh, an annual, I guess, a great annual event, the school-wide outdoor read, um, out, outdoor read that took place on September 22nd. Um, I'm not going to talk in detail about that. I know Gina will do that a little bit in her principal's update, but it was great to see the whole BRS community um, participating um, on a beautiful sunny Friday afternoon um, outside reading your books. All of you have hopefully received the BOA weather advisory notification. Um, BOA superintendents publish this every year and we send this out jointly so uh, you know what's going on and what the procedures are when we have those early dismissal or closing processes um, for those bad weather days. Uh, we've recently had um, two um, very um, dear staff members um, announced their retirements. Teaching assistant Onamay Schlossen, who's been here for over 20 years as a teacher assistant, recently submitted her letter of retirement. Um, she retired as of September 13th. We'd like to thank Onamay for just a wonderful um, many years of service. One of our custodians, Otis Burnett, who's been here for us for five years, also retired as of September 30th. Um, these two individuals will certainly be missed and uh, have already been or will be recognized by their close colleagues um, and other staff at a time in the future. So I'd like to thank them. Um, Margaret has already talked a little about, our, our chair has already talked about our ad hoc SRO committee, so um, we certainly have been kept up to date with the information on that committee, and I'd like to thank uh, everybody who's been part of that, um, the extra time that has been required. Um, our world language teachers um, this year provided their update during our curriculum committee meeting on October 5th, and I'd like to thank Stephanie Goldberg and Emily Roberts for doing a great job on this annual presentation. Lynn may talk a little bit more about that uh, during the curriculum uh, update in the meeting. In terms of communication, um, our parent update that I put out, as well as the Selectman's update, um, the, or the Selectman's newsletter, um, I hope that you enjoyed the most recent uh, parent update that I put out that went out on a Monday, October 2nd. Um, lots of different interesting things to read about there. Um, in addition to reaching out to all the Beecher Road School staff and parents, um, we are trying to reach out beyond um, the Beecher community, community into the full community. Um, so the selectmen have been very gracious to say, yes, I can have a little article <clears throat> in their town hall newsletter every month. So we have started that. We've had a couple already, and we have an entry going in tomorrow for the November 
um, newsletter. So uh, that's our way of getting news out to the town residents, which I think is an important thing to do and people are looking forward to. Uh, the Woodbridge Road Race took place on Saturday, October 7th. I bring that up because, as you know, many of our Beach Road School students participated in this event, and um, it's great to see that happen. Um, we have a wonderful running club that um, Beecher um, coordinates and collaborates with the Recreation Department three times a week before school. Um, some of our teachers, uh, Ms. Neov and Jeannie Charleglio, um, do a wonderful job at organizing that. So, um, anyway, so we'd like to just thank them for um, for what they've done. I know that they're actually involved in the children's race for the for the uh, Road Race. So, again, it's great to see these activities focusing on lifelong wellness for our kids. Tonight, the board will be um, um, voting on um, and discussing first the capital budget uh, request. So we thank you for your consideration of that. Um, also, our regular budget development process is underway. We are looking um, at every single area this year, which will prove to be the most challenging year that anybody can have in recent memory. So uh, you'll be hearing more about that as time goes on. We will be bringing some preliminary information to our finance subcommittee meeting in November, and then we'll be bringing the um, superintendent's recommended budget to you in December. But tonight you will be looking at capital. Um, congratulations goes to one of our um, bus owner operators. B&B Transportation was recognized um, recently as topping the 2016-17 bus safety ratings list for Connecticut. So congratulations to B&B. I've sent them a word of thanks and congratulations on behalf of all of us. On um, Thursday, October 5th, I had the pleasure of attending the MAG potluck dinner in the cafeteria. And I would say that um, besides the array of delicious dishes, um, it was great to see many alumni um, or ancestors, as, as they referred to, attend. Um, some of you around the table were there, of course. And uh, it just was a great opportunity and a great evening of camaraderie and community and people getting back together again. Um, ju just a wonderful evening. So I'd just like to thank the, uh, the MAG team and all those who supported that. Of course, all the parents who brought all the food and, and were there to, s to support their children, uh, as well as all of our alumni. We have two new community committees that you have heard about, beautification, as well as diversity <coughs> community. Um, and um, our beautification committee has started, um, has had several meetings, and where they have focused their time so far is to actually do a walkthrough of our building. Um, the goal here is to brainstorm ways, um, ways that are not so costly, of course, to enhance the appearance of our school, um, all areas, but especially entrances, hallways, and major gathering spaces. So uh, the committee is very excited about their work so far, just looking at things, talking, how do we do things differently, what should, um, what should we do in this area, with that area. Um, more information will come um, as we as we proceed through the months. Also, we've had our first meeting of the Diversity Community Committee. This is a committee um, comprised of parents, staff, and some of you as Board of Education members. Um, our first meeting was very exciting. We held, we held it before school. Um, we had great participation, great dialogue around the table. We talked a little bit about some of our current practices or talking about what are our current practices and activities that we actually have already in this area to build upon um, the foundation that we may already have. We talked about the need to find out a little bit about some data about um, different areas to, to, to use that for our next meeting. Um, the goal here is to just continue to have some conversation that will lead us eventually to what areas we want to focus on um, in terms of uh, whether it be activities, whether it be practices, whether it be something that would join the community and the school together. Um, so well, we'll keep you posted on that, but it's a very, very exciting group that is, is meeting. And we have another meeting coming up on October 25th. Um, lastly, I will just say that um, we're looking forward, I think I've already said, to, the, to this Saturday, um, to the PTO's uh, grand event, and also for Truck Retreat on uh, Halloween evening. Um, that concludes my report. Okay. Is there any questions for Bob? No, this Saturday. This Saturday. Yes, 21st. Yep. Yeah, that's yep. Right. No, it seems like it can't, that can't be true, but it is. <laughs> Buy your bands, right? Yes. It is happening. Yes, it is happening. Um, okay, the calendar. We have um, the suggested calendar for 2018 19. And Bob? Sure. Did I just say that right? 19, yeah. 2018 19, yeah, yep. that's correct. Okay. So um, this, this calendar that I'm putting forward for your um, 
you know, uh, observation and, and questions perhaps and uh, dialogue is um, based upon much of what the ACES calendar is, as well as the both superintendents coming together and discussing um, calendar options so we can be as close as possible in, our, in the way our calendars work. Um, just one little point, um, the act, there's actually legislation that's changed. Last year, we were, um, we were compelled to be part of a regional calendar that ACES put together. This year, legislation changed and we're no longer compelled to be part of the ACES calendar. However, um, ACES still went through the, through the process of bringing districts together, gathering thoughts, and they still put out their own ACES suggested calendar. Um, always superintendents came together as well. So you might ask, so what are the differences, what are the, um, what are the, what are the um, similarities, differences? I would say that for the most part, um, this calendar adheres to the ACES as well as the BOA superintendents collaboration together. The changes are the, or the differences are in just a couple of areas. Um, one is the actual start date in August. Um, uh, ACES does um, suggest starting on Monday the 27th and giving a full week in August. Um, some of the BOA districts are looking at having a couple of days of professional development and then starting on the Wednesday. Um, we so Traditionally, we here in Woodbridge in the last few years have started and had a full week, but that first day is a shortened day. And kindergarten actually has several shortened days during the course of that first week, so that helps our transition, our kindergarten students, their first week of public school to really make it uh, much more doable. So th there's one change, there, there's one, the one change for the August start time. Um, there is one district um, in BOA that is looking at Columbus Day as a teacher work day. It still will be no students, but it will be a teacher work day for professional development. Um, that's Bethany. And that Bethany has looked at their calendar, they have made their comments, um, they're going to be going for um, actual approval next month. Um, they did what we're doing tonight um, last week. Another difference, um, and it's really contractually, is on November 21st, the day before Thanksgiving. Um, our contract shows that as a teacher workday only for professional development, no students on that day. The other districts have school on that day for a short day. Um, we are all in sync. Uh, at this point with the shortened February time. Um, there was a lot of discussion around that, but that is the case. Some districts, some of our BOA counterparts actually have an early release on the 15th before the February long weekend. That's for purposes of half-day professional development. We do not have any half-day professional development in our current um, calendar or has not been practiced in the last couple of years. Um, you'll see March 15th is a professional development day. All the BOA districts are March 15th. We all have the same people vacation. Um, and we have some slightly different um, final days of school in June, uh, give or take a day, based upon some of the considerations I've already mentioned. Um, I will say that Orange has put out a survey, which um, it's kind of a, a, it's a little bit late in the game, probably, but they have just put out a survey. It may have closed or just about to close, and so they, they were probably they were probably the, the least sure about some of their calendar um, decisions at this point. Uh, so mostly, what I'm talking about for consistency is for sure Bethany and Amity. Orange probably will follow, I would think, in line with most of these areas. So it was a little bit random. I'm sorry, but those are, those are the, that's the main similarities and the main differences that you'll find. <coughs> Questions or whatever. Um, so listening. Yes. <coughs> uh, thanks, Bob, and uh, thanks for the clarification as far as the calendar formation. Um, last year, at this time, when we were um, asked to place a vote on the calendar for 17-18, I brought up um, the interest to consider the Lunar New Year as a school holiday. I'm citing the example that New York City has done that for two years. There's also legal observance in California since 2015. And also, in part, considering um, the significance in the burgeoning population of Asian Americans in the state and actually in this town. Uh, so actually, Woodbridge has the third highest Asian American population in the state of Connecticut. Um, and uh, in the state of Connecticut, 
um, Asian Americans make up 150,000 um, individuals in the population. And also, in light of the recognition, recognition of this major celebratory occasion, I think it also provides an opportunity uh, to acknowledge the contributions of Asian Americans, which we as a country have not really done in any significant way. Um, also, identifying that the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 was the only legislation against a group of people to enter this country, and the importance that our country is made up of immigrants, and that immigration policy, I think it would, we would take a leadership role, and one that I foresee will happen in the years to come, uh, for Woodbridge to consider um, making February 5th, and it's, uh, it's based on the lunar calendar, as Rosh Hashanah is, um, a uh, school holiday. Uh, and in comparison, just because I do appreciate and acknowledge the celebration of Rosh Hashanah and the religious uh, capacity around Yom Kippur, um, but as a comparison, um, 117,850 is the current, mostly latest Jewish population in the state of Connecticut. Um, and comparatively, Asian Americans make up 150,000, you know, 670. That's just as a point of not in all, at all suggesting in any way that we should not celebrate Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, <coughs> but just as a point of um, comparison. So I really think it's an opportunity for the town of Woodbridge and Beecher Road School to really take a leadership role. <coughs> Um, again, New York City uh, uses this as a public holiday, and there's legal observance in the state of California. And we can all feel um, within the school <coughs> the exponential growth of uh, Asian Americans in the school, but also um, in this town, where Woodbridge is really a preferential town to uh, to move to from uh, uh, when seeking an open neighborhood to live in. And Beecher, therefore, is also the, one of the main draws. So I, I just want to make sure, so you're proposing that we have Tuesday, February 5th off school? Is that what? I'm suggesting we have a day of recognition for the Lunar New Year. Um, it actually spans uh, 14 days as a celebration. celebration. The first day is February 5th. Um, but since it coincides so closely with the winter, winter holiday, perhaps we can piggyback a day on to the winter break, but really you know, try to encourage our population, our community, to sort of recognize it and for what it is, um, and for a moment to, um, an, an opportunity really to think about um, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, the internment of Japanese Americans, um, the Tet, I mean, many different holidays that Asian American communities celebrate. What does New York and California do if it's a 14th day? What day do they observe it? Is there? The first day. Yeah, the first day of the Lunar New Year. But this is based on the Lunar calendar, so as Rosh Hashanah is, it changes every year. And, and what day are you, this, we have a mandatory 181 days of school, so we have to put something back in the calendar in order to accomplish this. Do we have, do we currently have 180 days scheduled or 181? So in this calendar, it's referred to June 10th is the last day of school, June 10th is 181st day of school. So we actually have 181? That's, yeah. what, that's, what, that's what we have by, by contract. By contract. Yeah. Student, 181 student days, 184 staff days, 187 faculty. Contractually, we do have some days that are identified in the contract itself as days that are off. So those we can't mess with, right? Or we just that, that is correct. There are, okay. days, there are days in the contract that are um, specified. Um, now, some of those te teachers don't have holidays specified because teachers work whatever the school year has been dictated to be. Um, obviously, we, we, we avoid certain holidays because you know past practice. And from the tradition, but they don't have they don't have holidays in their contract they, because it's just talking about work days. Um, it's our sort of other union, the you know, non-certified groups that are having you know they have specified holidays. So I say they have you know Yom Kippur off. All, all the groups have Yom Kippur off. All the groups have you know um, Thanksgiving off. All the groups have Memorial Day, and so on and so forth. So, uh, I don't know if um, 
you had a motion or if there's more discussion? I cited more. I, I, cited, I brought it up last year. I'm bringing it up again this year. If it's too difficult to manage within the calendar this year, I do hope um, the contribution of my remarks will be taken a little bit more seriously as we can think about the 2019-20 calendar. And perhaps maybe I should put it upon myself to provide that additional information earlier in the year um, to before your BOA meeting. Uh, but I, I do think it is something of significance, but I'm comfortable um, just providing the contribution of information and then considering it more fully next year. I have a question. As an interim, can we call the 19th, which is the 14th day of the calendar year? <laughs> oh. I mean, acknowledge but, it. I mean, if it's what you want, is, you know, I'm just saying. I would really appreciate that. That would be fine by me to make okay. the 19th the celebration of the I was going to suggest that, but I thought that the 19th was actually the 15th day, so. Oh. Oh. <laughs> um, we can call it observed. I think it's observed. It, it, observed? It's, it, yeah. 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 That, we think that would be a wonderful one. Uh, I think that would be a step, perhaps, that would be in a direction that um, yeah. put us in the forefront. Um, and Bob had mentioned that the 15th of February right now is a half day in March. And it's, a half day, it's a half day in Amity and Bethany oh. for oh, professional yeah. development in the afternoon. I don't know what Orange will do with okay. that day. So. Um, it's a full day for us? Yes. Okay. okay, so do we need a motion to designate this as? I, I think it would be helpful if there was a motion okay. that. <coughs> Okay, I would like to make the motion to identify February 19th in the calendar, 2018-19 student calendar, observance of the Lunar New Year. And not Chinese New Year, Lunar New Year. Second. Okay, any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Okay, thank you Great. so much. So, so just as a clarification for the audience, if you're listening here or on, on TV, um, that that day is already a day that we have marked off for the long February weekend. And so we're designated that day uh, in celebration of the Lunar New Year. Um, and so we will not incur an additional day off, but right. it gives the recognition, which I think is, uh, is duly noted and duly important. Okay. Was there any other? Oh, I'm sorry. Claire. Just had an idea. Perhaps as part of the diversity initiative, there could be some educational component around the Lunar New Year so students understand what it is and what many of their fellow students are celebrating. And I, and I think there are celebrations now, and I think we call it the Chinese New Year, um, but I do think that there are celebrations in the school now um, around that holiday so we can, um, you know, maybe focus a little more and make sure that we're um, politically correct in, you know, how we're discussing it. Great. Okay. I move we approve the calendar as a Okay. Second. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor? So we're not even waiting until next month. We're this is like, it. this is amazing. <laughs> right. It's the first time Steve's voted for the calendar since. Sure, I, mean, so I don't like it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good to know. Okay. All right. All right. I'll keep them under the table. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, and, and you know, I, I hate to back up because I know you're trying to move us forward, but I give skip Gina again. Like, okay. I always do. Oh, Isn't goodness. Gina right after you usually? Whatever the agenda says, Madam well, Chairman, let's see what's inside here. She doesn't never make the agenda is the problem. See, that's how come I always uh, so, no, I, uh, so actually, you know, we have the accountability yeah. report and then the summer programs review and then she gets to do her okay. 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 Yeah. Oh, BRS update. Okay. So we then are on the accountability report. Accountability? Yeah. And I think you have slides. Some slides. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll get out of the way. Hopefully. Hopefully we have slides. Hopefully we have slides. Just to, just to kind of lay the background here, most of you know that we have uh, in, in the winter, spring, we present the accountability report uh, of, of a wide variety of data points that the um, state provides us. And uh, we identified a few areas, you can see the three areas that we'll talk about tonight, areas that we know that, areas we wanted to address, what are we doing about them, how are they going, um, where are they at right now, so that's why these three are up here. Um, I remember from last spring. 
So good evening, everyone. And so as Mr. Gilbert mentioned, um, these are areas when we received our report last year um, that we partic paid particularly close attention to. So the first area, <coughs> or not. <laughs> Mr. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so the first area is chronic absenteeism. And so I do want to make a clarification for folks who may not be sure exactly what this is. It, in a, for a student to be considered chronically absent, they must be absent 10% of the school year. So if you have a child who was out but went to the doctor, we call it an excused absence. Extended absences, including the, uh, you know, out of the country travel, hospitalization, extended um, medical absences, it doesn't matter as long as the child was not physically here in the school, they are counted as absent for this accountability report. So um, if you're traveling out of the country for three weeks, that's 15 days, you're three days away from being considered chronically absent. Or <laughs> if there's a child who has to have a hospitalization because they had surgery on their leg and they're out for 20 days, that child falls under chronically absent. <coughs> So just so that we have a clear understanding of what that is. But looking at our data, so if you look, um, the first two bullet points tell you, remember this data is always a year behind. So 2015, 2016, um, the district had 5% of our students considered chronically absent compared to the state. And then we decreased that a little bit the following year as we worked on that. Again, the state decreased it a little bit as well, but we were still well under the state. And then, Unofficially, we haven't gotten the accountability report yet, but we have reduced it again. So we are working on doing that. Um, how are we doing that? And then I'll talk a little bit about the second part of it. So phone calls. We do have a system where at the end of each month, um, our schools are database, and it is generated a report for us students who have been absent a certain number of times. And we do send those letters <coughs> and make communications to families. Um, we put information in the principal's message about being in school, direct people to what the attendance policies are, <coughs> so we do try to communicate. Where we are still struggling a little bit um, are our high need students. Um, so you can see that our district data is still far below the state, but not where we want it to be. So we are still looking at that and finding, again, using some of those same ways to um, communicate to parents the importance of being here. And again, discrepancies, we know that things happen. We know children get sick. But the state, in the state's eyes, those 18.1 you know, days, um, that are 18 days that the students need to be here if they are not here, it's chronically absent. I need, just, I need is defined as special education, EL students, English language learners, and as well as an economically disadvantaged with the three so our participation rate, um, as you probably remember, is based off of our SFACS um, tests. So this is the information of the students who took the SFAC test for 2015-2016 and then 2016-2017. You'll notice it's broken down into both ELA and math. So our goal is always to return to a 95% participation rate because that is what we are required to have by the State Department of Education. Um, in the past, um, we were given, our, I should back up and say that our participation rate is also tied into our accountability index rating. Um, and in the past, we were given a high rating based on years and years ago doing really, really well on the CMTs. Um, and then we were given a pause because we did do really well, and now the state is looking closely at this data in order to determine our um, accountability index rating. Um, so it's quite important that we continue to work on increasing our participation rate on these SVAC tests. Um, so initially, when we first were administering the SVACs, when parents were choosing to opt out, we began to call parents personally and reach out to them and talk to them about their reasoning and 
explain to them the importance and the value of the SBAC test. Um, we took a pause on that, um, and that is something that we are going to start again this year. Um, we also, I brought show and tell, we also, we also purchased a um, brochure that we are going to provide to parents who are opting their students out. Oh, gosh, that's too high audience. Um, and it just says nine reasons to support standardized testing, and it's just another informational way to share um, with parents. And um, we also are sharing information through the principal message, um, not only about the value and the importance of participating, but also sort of the other side of that, how that impacts um, our school. Um, oh yeah, thank you. So we need the 95% in ELA and math in all students and in high need students. So you'll notice again that our high need students is an area that we um, will continue to focus on. So I have, I have a question on participation rates. Our participation rates when we were taking the CMTs and even the science CMT participation rate was like 100 percent or 99 percent. So um, do you think, and we're talking about this is a communication, this is an understanding you know, kind of thing that we need to make sure that parents understand the impact of um, you know, whether their, their child is participating. But we also had a pretty high participation rate for um, our high needs on science. Do I, our high needs test as well. Okay. So, is there any? Is it just the name aspect that is part? Because yeah. CMTs are online now. They're the same. It, it's the. It's really a diff, It's called something different, but mm -hmm. it's the same. And we're moving obviously out of the CMTs and into the new science. Right. Um, and I also think you? that aspects when they were first administered, um, they took longer. Um, they cut out some of the SBAC testing. If you remember, there used to be a performance task in language arts and in math. They eliminated the performance task in language arts, so now there's only the performance task in math. Um, so I think that my sense is that there was this feeling like it was you know, weeks and weeks and weeks of testing, and, and it's really not. You know, We block off a lot of time because students are given um, as much time as they need, really, to complete the assessment, but we don't actually test for, yeah, we a test for an hour a day. Many students finish within a day and a half, but, you know, on our calendar, we often will block out like two weeks because that counts for makeup tests or, you know, so I think that there's also this sense that it's this really ginormously, hugely stressful thing, and, you know, it's really maybe an hour and a half. And I was going to say, because we looked at the amount of time spent on CMTs yes, versus right. SPACs, yep. it is less time, less, less time. hours, yeah. everything about it is better than CMTs, but the PR about it is worse, right. Right. which has resulted in us having such a low participation, which negatively affects the school district. Right. Correct. So when uh, initially, as Lisa mentioned, you know, I made those calls to, to parents and had conversations, and there was some misinformation about what was being done with the information or where, you know, how the data was collected. Um, and, and that's when, you know, the whole shift to it being online, there, there was definitely a pushback. Um, now that the CMTs themselves are even online, you know, we will return to making those calls and um, talking to parents about the impact for the whole school. And, you know, hopefully we will have a better percentage rate because we did get the downgrade instead of, you know, the highest achievement level that we could be. Um, this, uh, this did drop us a level as a, as a school district. And so, other than individual parents, I mean, do we have the, we have the brochure? Does that talk about the you know the fact that you know that the participation rate affects the school? Like, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, as opposed, no, this does not. No, it okay. says that we have to, you know, that we're yes, we're required to give it. Students are required to take it or we're required to offer it, um, but it does not specifically talk about the accountability. Okay. It, that all, I mean, all it references is it says that the law requires high participation. Okay. So, um, are are you maybe looking either to hear an update or an actual superintendent's academy or some kind of way to communicate to parents the um, effect of some of these, you know, including you know that the chronic absenteeism. You know, I know that's 18 days, so you know, that's that's a lot of days. But obviously, we you know we have we have that happening, and then also just um, general information that the SBAC is you know and, and, and you know I don't want to get into like it takes less time than the CMT and all that stuff and like you know because it doesn't make sense to compare it anymore 
But, you know, we spent a lot of time, um, you know, Mr. Robert, on, you know, what's the best tool? You know, kids, you know, did they want to take it on a desktop? Did they want to take it on a laptop or a, an iPad? So we spent a lot of time getting to where the kids are comfortable, you know, with the test and, and take it. And like you said, time spent is, is minimal. Um, so I don't, I don't know if we can, you know, we can put something out in addition to the brochure, you know, maybe something with it that gives parents a little more comfort level with, um, you know, some of the misinformation, you know, and, and a lot of it, when that, the aspect came out, was tied to teacher evaluation. It was sort of, you know, it, there was a lot of stuff going on that is no longer, you know, so part of the picture. So, in thinking, sometimes things, you know, get buried. Not that you all don't like to read my principal's message every <laughs> single word, but th things can get buried. So, yes. a separate notification, yes. possibly, okay. or you know, um, some type of information that's directed just to that to help people have a, a better sense of what that means. For right? mm -hmm. and I think. Not to forget also that you know it, the testing changed, but also the testing was highly linked to I think the thing that really got people going, which was Common Core state standards. Right, right. And so that was that was really the driver of that. And, and so and yes, the, the testing linked to that because we were look, we were looking at testing in a 21st century manner, um, new standards, higher standards. So I think that was part of that. I do think we can offer a superintendent's academy, and we would have to step back and think about that a little bit. I think though, I think the the way through this is is one one to one individual education for people who are really not sure they want their child to go th with, with testing. So, but I do think that perhaps providing to the greater community, the greater school community, the, the, the information, mm -hmm. just you know what this is, what this means. Because literally, what this means is, um, you know, a school like this, and, and I, 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 in here, even just 15, 16 months, there's a tremendous amount of pride, tremendous amount of pride in this community, in this school. And people want that recognized, and and the, the achievement levels that are in this building are the same achievement levels that I experienced in the district that I was in previous, in a school that I was principal of, a school that had school distinction. Which, by the way, this school had the school distinction honor a few years ago, but we are unable to reach that, which really reflects who we are as a community and the pride we have in this school for that. We're unable to be even considered for that because of that percentage falling under 95. So I think, so it's good that the board has wanted more information about this, and I think it, it's given us thought about how do we get that message out to the greater group, and how do we continue to help to, you know, uh, educate and, and talk yeah. to individuals. And, and again, I think if there's any anything that faculty can use to, to help, sure. you know, to help parents understand, you know, the, the significance of this, and, and to a degree, you know, there's lots of times you don't even know your kid's doing it. You know, they don't, you know, they, they take it, they're done, they move on, um, you know, and I, I think it's a little different than perception. And something you said, Margaret, was, you know, we have high participation rate for CMT. For as long as there's been education, there's been standardized assessments. You know, so it's just a different format. Yeah. And the science fifth grade, we don't have the same. Science fifth grade, we're over 95%. So we're people, at 99%. So people clearly look at the two depth tests in a different way. Um, okay. All right, Kate. What? We'll just call it CMT. Yeah. <laughs> so um, to talk a little bit about, you know, and, and before I go any further, we have some people in the audience that can help answer some questions if we need any. So Mr. Lavoie is here from Business of Education. So um, if there are questions about any information that I share, um, he can help do that. All right, so he's representing that. So participation rate is fine for us here. Um, so the fitness rate and the percentage of points earned out of 100. So we did have a drop. Certainly you see from 2015 to 2016, but we are again still above the state. What I just want to make sure that people are aware, are aware, we're comparing two different sets of children. So and this is actual activity for students. So the, the sit reach, the push-ups, the curl-ups, crunches for those of you who might not know miss that, and the, um, the run. So this is it's not a test that children sit and take. It's their actual activities. So there's practice for that. Um, the pacer is one of our practices. You can see the students with the box trying to do their sit and reach. 
and I happened to be up in um, the North Gym and there were some sit-ups happening or curl-ups as they are called. <coughs> so it is a different cohort every year, but one of the areas that was noted as to be one of the weaker areas last year were push-ups, so upper body strength. So that's something that the uh, PE team is working on. Um, but we do have another set of children, completely different set that will be assessed this year. But they have set themselves a goal it's to be about 62 percent. Put so some then. lead tape on the back of the iPads. <laughs> 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 so, um, if there's any questions about that, you know that I can't answer, I'll certainly address it to you so the way. So, in a in a normal um, gym class, as part of our curriculum, we don't have the kids do curl ups every day or push ups every class, or we do. Uh, do so, they like do. that would be included, like. Like generally, you come to my class, we warm up, and then we go through a general set of exercises, which include those because they need practice, especially for this test. Right. Um, but we do use the fitness center a lot too. Like I know with my sixth grade class, I get them for an hour block and a half hour block. So usually that half hour block, we're in the fitness center doing like circuit training, working on upper body strength and sit ups, trying to get those numbers up. Even if we didn't need to have the numbers for this, is this something? These activities are ones you would encourage. Absolutely. Okay. If you, I mean, if you look at the report card, we, it's very fitness based. I mean, even starting from like first grade, we're having kids learn push ups, sit and reach, uh, horizontal pull up instead of a vertical pull up. Um, they do like a modified quarter mile, modified pacer test. So the high school, fitness. by the way, is pushing push ups. There's push ups in the kid classes so every day. Okay. Any okay. questions? Any questions for that? Because okay, that concludes those areas for us. So are there any questions that we haven't addressed? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we need to keep going. One more. We have another. We have another. Oh, we have another one. We go right to the next one. Okay. So before we uh, get started, I'd just like to thank our uh, some of our summer school directors. Um, Program directors for being here tonight, Sandy Simowitz, our summer enrichment program um, director, who's here. Sandy, raise your hand. I'm there here. you go. Yeah. There you go. Get a credit. Credit. And Tim Rourke, our assistant uh, director of extended days, here, and uh, they're here to answer any questions you may have uh, after we go through the presentation. Um, those are our two major programs. Um, Gina and Lisa will be presenting a little information about all the programs that happen in Feature Road. Uh, I just like to say that um, these, these are these are great programs. This is not happening in every district. Um, so those of you who are only familiar with this, this school, this town, you may think this happens everywhere. It does not happen everywhere. Um, so um, hats off to those who make this happen and have seen it evolve over the years and have seen it improve over the years and uh, more and more offerings and more and more participation. All right, so we'll start with a little bit of extended day. And as um, Mr. Gilbert said, i just like to say thank you as we certainly went to these the leaders of these programs to get some information so we're giving you an overview if there are questions we will certainly turn to them um, so we're just giving you some numbers here early morning for those of you who are not sure what that is that is before the program starts there's the early morning drop off um, we have that during the school year but they also have it in the summer and um, our regular day enrollment is about 55 students that's an average and that enrollment, similar um, in the early morning to 16, you know, to the 16 school year. And the program, we have some couple of new things were offered. Um, kind of a little shift, not even new, a shift, I'll say. If you look at the things that are offered in the program, crafts, board games, outdoor activities, there was a bit of a shift to make sure that there were not individual technology time, meaning we wanted more interaction child to child. So during the school year, tech um, was kind of one of the hot spots. So they thought, let's try to shift a little bit of that. And um, you know, just to have that more social interaction. So I think that was a nice shift for them. Just a, a little change. I think, what, I think that Kathy called them, um, she called it um, vintage. Games or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, right. 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 Clue. Yeah. And I was like, wait a second. <laughs> you just became vintage. I'm sure. I'm sorry. Um, but, and again, those are games that you know, are now all available through technology. So to bring those game board games back out is a novelty for some kids. Um, not for all, but for some. I want to highlight the coordination between all the programs. 
So you'll hear from, you know, about some other programs tonight. The ingress in the morning, the shift from early morning enrollment to SEP or off to rec or off to summer scholars, and then that time at the end of those morning programs to head off to extended day, the coordination that that takes is nothing short of amazing. And, and then there's changes in who actually has to go to extended day today and who's not going to extended day today. So um, just kind of think about for a minute of what that takes, and they do it so well. So that's just a little bit of an overview um, about, oh, and the enrollment to start this school year, not summer, just so you have an idea. We're averaging about 160 to 170 students per day at extended day. Yeah. So. Can I ask something real quick? I forgot an important person in the room. So Teresa Nakuzi's over there, and she's a summer scholar coordinator. And Her slide's coming up. Don't yeah. worry. Okay. So I'm sorry, I forgot. I'm here. You were hiding over there. So <laughs> thank you for being here. And thank you, Mr. So our summer enrichment program continues to be a very vibrant and active part of our community. Um, we have seen an enrollment increase. Um, so our enrollment in this past summer surpassed the um, pre-construction enrollment. Um, so we are at six, we were at 671 students last year, which is just tremendous. Um, is that 671 separate students or 671 because some students will take three multiple weeks? Yeah, yeah, multiple enrollments, right? Multiple enrollments. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the really great thing about the Summer Enrichment Program, there's many really, really, really great things about the Summer Enrichment Program, but not only does it provide a lot of opportunities for our students, um, and so <coughs> it's such a large variety, but it also allows the adults to share things that they're really passionate and interested in that they can sort of do outside of the school hours. Um, we continue to offer our um, introduction to kindergarten, which is wildly popular. Um, theater continues to be incredibly popular. Um, they did a lot of new offerings this past summer. They did Fantastic Beasts, they did Galaxy of Creativity, and there was a Peace Academy. Um, and the other nice thing about it is that there are community members that come in, students, some of them more, uh, many of them are graduates of teacher, um, and they come and they volunteer and they get some um, community service hours working back at feature, um, which is really, really nice. So we'll move on and we'll finish up and then we'll have if there's any questions for the folks that took the time to come. So Summer Scholars, yes. speaking of Mr. Cousy. So um, just a little history on Summer Scholars. This is a program that's been going on at Beecher for um, 15 plus years. And initially it was um, language arts based. Um, two summers ago, they actually started including um, mathematics. And that was a really um, well accepted and loved addition. So they continued that this past summer. It's a program that's offered to students in grades two through five. Um, Sometimes the students are ones who are struggling, some of the students who are just really close to benchmark, some of the students are on benchmark and they just need to um, push to sort of maintain their skills. Um, this past summer they actually did something really new. Um, they actually sent out a parent survey and they were able to sort of get some feedback on how the program was running, if the parents had any suggestions. Um, overwhelming positive response. Parents were very satisfied um, with their students, um, with their child participation in this program, and a lot of parents just commented very favorably on the program overall. So Ms. Kennedy is going to kind of share a little bit about extended school um, year. Yeah, so we have a number of students that do their PPT are recommended for summer program, we call it extended school year, and um, again, the recommendations made through the PPT and de determining uh, and determined by the needs of the students. So we have a wide variety of programs, beginning with preschool, so we have a preschool program, we have a, I hate to use the word self-contained, but a, a program for students that have more significant special needs. And then we have students that come in, um, sometimes for an hour a day, sometimes for two hours a week, sometimes for two hours a day, or whatever, for direct academic instruction with our special ed teachers. So based on the child's needs, we meet, we meet their needs. And many of our kids uh, go to E-Day, before and after, so just like, in, or, or go to rec and come back in. So just like Gina and Annalisa said, the coordination between all the programs is phenomenal. We didn't lose anybody. So um, the last program that happens um, over the summer is the Workers' Recreation, of course. I mean, we are not, that's not something that is run by the teacher of the school, but obviously housed within 
our building. Um, there were four new programs offered under the Wilbur's Recreation umbrella, and they did see a decrease of enrollment in um, this past summer of 198 students. And Gina actually caught um, my touch of Jim Franco. So, you know, when I tried to ask him if he had any thoughts behind, and he kind of just really said competition. There's a lot of programs out there for kids in the summer, um, and so you know, well, he didn't have any proof for that. He just thought that that would be one of the things because so many more summer programs are being offered. So the decrease is 198 kids. How many kids were in rec? Mm -hmm. What is it? Was it? I think it's the same kind of way of figuring like Sandy's program. By weeks, and I can get that oh. information, but I do not have that. Oh, okay. I think it's around 1,100 to back down to 900. No, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can give you that. I can give you exactly that. 1,176, not children, but those were the units. science units, and then 978 for summer. Okay. Yeah. And some of the new programs that I refer to were um, chess, um, they offered clay date this past summer, um, there was Lego, and there was um, yoga for children, children's yoga. So this last slide. Um, well, almost last. Oh, second to last. Second to last slide. Um, summarizes the financial aspects of programs. Again, they're all, they're, and when I say all, I've, I'm really extended days, a 12-month year-round uh, program where summer enrichment really lives five weeks out of the summer. But both are intended to be self-sustaining and draw no funds from the Board of Ed. In fact, as you will see, there is reimbursement from the programs for various. No, we don't heat the building in the summer, but there is a 12-month allocation for heating and slash air conditioning that is reimbursed and passed back to the Board of Ed as a credit from the programs. So what you're seeing here, that first column, uh, extended day, summer of 2017, is actually July in that first week of uh, August 2017. So that's current summer program. Um, the extended day generated about $34,000 in tuition revenue and operated with a net loss of about $33,000. Um, the, the center column extended day for fiscal year 2017 is actually the period that runs July 2016 through June of 2017. So that's measuring 12 months of extended day tuition and thankfully uh, net income of just under $37,000, but again, including pass-through reimbursements back to the Board of Ed for various operating costs, payroll, and building maintenance related. Lastly, um, we're seeing summer enrichment, which again, this is for summer enrichment program, five weeks for this past July and August. Um, program revenues, tuition is just over 84000 and actually, this is a bit of an anomaly for the program. They finished with a net income of about 7,400. Um, recent history has shown close to a break even for the program. But again, living to the intent of, of both programs, they're self-sustained. I have, I have a couple questions. We used to do the programs for six weeks. And I know, I don't know if we moved to five during the construction and we want to keep it at five or it's just that we go longer in June. Um, Sandy, so did we used to always do we SEP did. at six weeks? Um, we I, the the first year that I took over SEP, it was a five-week program. That was 2013. I do know that prior years they had been six weeks. Okay. I think a major part of that was uh, a recognition that the custodial staff needed time to prepare the building for the teachers to use it in the school year and for the rooms and so forth to be ready for children uh, in August. So uh, I think unilaterally a decision was made to drop it down to five weeks. And then one of the years that we were at Amity, they dropped us down to four weeks. So. And when, has, when were the last time we changed fees for like summer enrichment? I know we kind of I, held pretty steady, right? Yeah, I've, again, I've been uh, the director for, this is my fifth year, and we have not changed the fees at all. Um, I can't speak for Extended Day. Extended Day hasn't changed their uh, fees for 
years. I can't ever remember how long ago it was, but Larry Hurwitz, I believe, was the director the last time that we made a change in our pricing. So, so I can't see you. So feasibility. About, about how last, long ago was that, do you think? Uh, for at least eight years. At least eight, eight years? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and then the district programs, those are not fee-based. Summer right. scholars. Summer, summer, summer scholars, scholars has a fee, has okay. a small fee um, okay. attached to it. And um, special education, no. But our special, special education, no. Special right. education, okay. no. Okay. And right. obviously Rec does, but I couldn't speak by much. Yeah. So, so finally, um, one of the great things about our programs is the staffing. You know, they are former VRS students, they are current staff, TAs, teachers, <laughs> teacher assistants, you know, folks that work here, but there's also some guest folks that come in, so which is great for our students as well. And no matter what the students go to, they have an enriching experience. And as a parent, um, I would be really happy to know where my child, that my child was here right at school, where, where they went all year long, and then they were comfortable. So that is it. So we do have, and I want to say thank you, Teresa, and for providing Tim. information, and Tim, and Sandy, and just Jim Franco as well for providing the information for us. And I want to say thank you as well. <coughs> These programs are great. Um, they're, they really are. I mean, they're just, it's just fun to see the kids. You know, REC has its, you know, it, it's, its specialty, and SEP has its, and, and Extended Day is fantastic all the time. So, thank you. Did anybody have any questions or statements? Or? Okay. Thank you to everybody who came, and thank you for the information. So, Take it up saying to do the Yes, you are. Okay. Now we can move So, back. Um, thank you, everyone, again. So you heard Bob mention that we did have our outdoor summer read. This has kind of become a tradition for us now to kick off and end the school year. And everyone outside with their books, either reading sometimes <coughs> together with buddies or reading by themselves or listening to the teacher read. Um, but it's just a, a little way that we celebrate um, literacy here and it has really become a great tradition. Um, we do have two programs returning to our after school, the Mount Olympiads um, and Poetry Guild. Parents who should be receiving or should have received that information um, coming out to you. Mr. De Palma and Mrs. Mechanics are going to be working in math again this year and Mr. Chase for Poetry. So we thank them for uh, coming back to the table. PTO already spoke. I have a few thank yous for them as well. Um, we have the great authors, nothing but praise from the students and from the faculty. Our Harvest Hike, you heard lots of attendance this year. It was a beautiful day that helped, so thank you for that. And then we have the Hoot. So, yes, I will be in the dunk tank as well as Mr. Gilbert <laughs> and Mrs. Do you know what I'm going to be in there? <laughs> and, uh, I think that's being held secret. Um, <laughs> So, yes, we will do that, but it really is just an, a, an amazing, amazing event. And um, so we thank everybody for their the volunteers. I mean, honestly, it's a host of people that helped to put this together. So we couldn't do it without them. <coughs> National School Lunch Week. You heard about the taste test, but that was the last week during National School Lunch Week. So with the uh, support of our, some of our staff members, students were able to either, our younger grades, draw their favorite fruit or vegetable, or write what their favorite fruit or vegetable was, and at the entrances to the cafeteria on either side, you can see those post-its um, from what the students like to eat. So we thank the people for that. It was fire safety week last week, so we have the fire truck here, and our primary grade all went out. Thank you to Joe Capucci, as always, for being here, and the volunteer firefighter, and all the gear, and then um, the children. It's an important lesson for them to learn, but this year's theme, Every Second Counts, Plan Two Ways Out. So that was the theme for this year. So some important safety information. Um, this month we have a few drills. We know safety is priority for us. So yes, fire safety week happened. Um, tomorrow will be our bus evacuation where the children practice getting off the back door of the bus safely. And um, it was today. Today's only Monday, sorry. Wednesday, that's happening. And that doesn't affect the staff. That happens right when they're unloading the buses. Um, so we're, we should be fine there. The end of the month, there will be our school evacuation drill. And that is, we do a dismissal. Just as we normally would, 
with the exception of students who would typically go to eBay or rec, just go in line with their actual bus. When we get on the buses, we load north and south, swap the way we do a dismissal, load again, and kind of drive around and unload. So um, we switched to that plan uh, about two years ago now, just as a regular dismissal, and it really works out perfectly. Um, all the students, you know, so, but it is not another one of our drills. Today, you should have received, as a parent, a, a notification from me that we had a practice lockdown today. A thank you, as always, to Officer Lynch and the Woodbridge Police Department and several officers accompanying us. Um, so the administrative team it was part of that walk through the building to clear the classrooms. The students, as always, were amazing. Um, I guess you can say fortunately or unfortunately, this is a reality. So this is something they practice. They know how important it is. Everyone was following, doing exactly what they were supposed to be doing. We even did it a little differently. We had a group outside at recess this year when this happened. So, um, and that was something that we hadn't practiced, I will say that. So we made sure to do that, and uh, I have to compliment those students that were out there and the adults. So I know that, you know, these are difficult topics to have a conversation about, but they're important topics, and we practice, and we practice announced so that we can look for any gaps or any holes in our plans. And fortunately, we have some really good plans, so we'll do our tweaking as we always do. And you know, if we ever have to have one unannounced, we're all ready. Parent conferences are happening. I know we have two days, Tuesday and Thursday, with that 110 dismissal. Those are you know slated for conferences. But knowing the busy lives of the parents and that the teachers really want to have conversation, tough to get them in in those two days, so they are happening really, we should just call it conference month, because they are happening before school, after school, during lunch times. Um, so thank you to the teachers for their flexibility and parents for making the time um, to come and <coughs> listen to your child's progress. Uh, thank you. And um, finally, following the belief that we're a caring community, um, we have a lot of collections kind of going on right now. The Woodbridge Rotary Club, the Coat Drive, we are also doing um, hats and gloves. You can contact Mr. DeLuca. That was in my principal's message. Certainly collections for the hoot. And then you will be receiving, if it didn't go out today, um, the student council has organized their drive for the victims of the most recent hurricanes. So food and items. We divvied up by grade. I want to say thank you to the student council. We met, the adults met first with um, some of the student council advisors and some other members of the staff. I sat in on the meeting with the children of student council to help make the decisions. The children made the decisions, not the adults, on um, what it is um, that we should be thinking about. It's difficult as a child to think about want versus need. So when something like toys came up, you know, we had to have the conversation that that is a great want, but um, there's some things that they really need right now. And so you'll get that list by grade. And uh, once again, a thank you to the student council. Uh, the adults and the children for organizing the time. So that's my report. Right. Any questions for Dina? Thank, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What? You did? No? no? Okay. Okay. Great job. <laughs> Moving along, apparently. That's what Paul's trying to do. All right. Um, so, facilities. Can we have a brief facilities report? Yes. Uh, we got together uh, this evening. Met and, uh, walked around the building. Uh, in, primarily in the areas where, uh, uh, in the exterior of the building, so, uh, primarily, primarily in the areas where the students uh, frequent, and as well as visitors, and looked at the conditions of the grounds in general and uh, items that have been identified in the past as needing attention, uh, whether it be due to runoff or just basic deterioration because of time, and in upcoming meetings, we will be focusing down on what we deem to be important moving forward, especially considering we've got extreme budget considerations uh, coming up, and with a focus uh, primarily on uh, safety of the people around the building. Okay. Great. Thank you. Finance. We have a couple motions. Yes, we do. So okay. the first one is, um, before we present it, we need a motion to adopt the capital budget. Um, I move that we approve the 2017 18 capital projects as presented for submission to the boards of selectmen. Second. It's actually 2018. Second. Okay. Um, 
second. Sorry. Okay. Okay. All right. Did so in the capital budget that you have, we discussed the bill. You want to run through it, Bob, or you want me to? Um, your pleasure. So essentially, if you remember in the past, we've done a larger uh, amount for our technology. And last year, the Board of Selectmen asked us to move most of our technology budget into operations in the normal renewal cycle. So what we're keeping in capital are items that are more structural. So in this case, uh, the capital budget is requesting needed upgrades for a virtual server. Um, we have some servers that are outdated, old, uh, their life expectancy and need to be replaced. Um, this would essentially build a better infrastructure for all of the servers housed in one location that are being serviced throughout the school. Um, so the $46,000 line item for the technology is essentially upgrading the infrastructure items, wireless network expansion, switches, as well as the virtual server. Um, that's the technology component. On the buildings and grounds, we're requesting $50,000, and that is essentially, um, we put together a Fuss and O'Neill report probably dating back about five years. Um, we've done a lot of those projects. One of the concerns is we did uh, get paving through a steep grant for the entire south parking lot. Um, we have a large hill between the upper and the lower part, as well as from the fields coming down um, that have the potential to cause some erosion issues related to the paving. And in order to make sure we extend the life expectancy of the paving that we did, um, we really don't want any erosion from what's going on. So that's really about sort of fixing those sloped areas, getting proper vegetation, making sure we have proper runoff so we're not damaging um, the work that was already accomplished. Um, we did put in there $135,000 for asphalt and paving. Essentially, we've done most of the paving in the parking lot. The one area that we haven't is in the north parking lot, um, which was the one area that was not addressed in the last deep grant. Um, this would also widen the paved access path to the rear campus, which would be used for first responders if we don't have good access in that area. And then lastly is a $25,000 line item for kitchen items. Um, this is replacing two pieces of equipment that were installed back in 1997. Um, one of them is a, a range steamer at $18,000 in a six burner commercial range that's 6,700. Uh, they are long past their life expectancy, um, and so uh, Questions? Questions? All right, so we have a motion. All those in favor? Good. Great. Thank you. And there's one more motion in finance, I think. So. so the next one is related to a transportation contract. So just briefly, um, we, um, despite having regional sort of buses between Bethany, Orange, Woodbridge, and Amity. Um, we have different times that the contracts with these vendors expire. So we have a contract with, um, let's say, one of the vendors for feature. Some of the inclusion in our contract is runs at Amity Middle School and High School, and some of the contracts that Amity has with their bus contractors, which are the same we use, cover not only their runs, but some of ours. Several years ago, all of our contracts ran on different schedules. So when our schedule ended and others didn't, um, we, we couldn't negotiate as one. Um, so all of the districts agreed a few years ago to try to get their contracts to end in 2020 at the same time so that we could move forward and do the contract negotiations as one. Um, our contract is up this year. Um, we have an extension option on our contract two years. Um, we were offered a longer extension <laughs> Um, but the Finance Committee um, felt that we should basically keep the contract extension to 2020 so that we're in line with the Bow School District so we can go out to bid afterwards. Um, so the motion is uh, that we authorize the administration to discuss continuation of the current contract with the owner-operators for the option of a two-year extension. And again, we are very happy with our owner-operators. We love the group of people that we have. It's been a great relationship, and we hope this one continues for a long time. Just in the semblance of trying to do more things regionally, um, we really want this contract to line up with the other. Second. Yep. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Okay. Great. <coughs> Great. Thank you. Um, that's all you got? Okay. Um, policy. Uh, the policy. 
Policy Committee has been uh, pretty active, uh, thanks to Superintendent Gilbert for providing and doing a really hard look um, at our policies, some of which have, um, are a little bit out of date, not terribly out of date, but um, in good timing for uh, consideration, and also to Marsha, who is our policy memorizing every <laughs> policy ever uh, implemented at Beecher. It's just amazing um, a trove of information for us. Uh, just a quick update. Uh, we have presented in your packet two policies um, that have been revised. Uh, not a motion to vote on today, but policy 7551 uh, is the policy that we are suggesting. A couple of edits. Please look at it. Naming of major facilities. Um, and also policy 3280, which is edits and amendments to the policy regarding business and non-instructional operations, gifts, grants, bequests, and memorials. Um, as is stated in our bylaws, uh, we present them to the board uh, to consider over a 30-day review uh, to vote on at the next board meeting, uh, from my understanding. The other policies that we're looking at um, are attendance, uh, truancy, uh, further down the road, employer verification, student confidentiality, sexual abuse, harassment, and restraint, and seclusion. Also, a uh, par parent presented uh, two meetings ago uh, regarding policy 6154 regarding homework policy, and that is something that we also have on the agenda for uh, the next meeting looking at the homework policy. So, I'd like to put forth a motion. Um, on the final uh, part of the policy committee update, which is the ad hoc class size committee. Uh, the, the committee really wants to move to establish an ad hoc committee to review class size guidelines. Um, this committee would commence in January 2018 with membership in charge to committee as presented, a makeup similar to the security, the SRO committee that was formed earlier this year. Uh, the reason the policy committee suggests setting up this ad hoc committee is because we feel that uh, different constituency groups within the community uh, should have a voice and input into class size, uh, considering issues such as how are we leveraging technology, how does that affect uh, class size, how are we looking at some of the fundamental critical issues as compared to other class size rooms across this country. Um, so I'd like to present that motion for the board to consider. Is there, is there any discussion? So we're, the motion is to create an ad hoc committee to look at class size guidelines. Um, okay. All right, all those in favor? Get everybody vote. Okay, all right. Okay, all right. Um, ACEs, um, I am now attending the, um, the ACEs meetings. We had one last week. Last week, yeah, um, and um, it's really similar to what goes on here. We get um, updates on finances, we get updates on projects, we get updates on enrollment, um, and right now, um, Aces is operating in the red, um, which is typical, I guess, for Aces at the beginning of the year. They're actually doing much better than they usually do. Um, we currently don't have anybody in the Aces schools. Although ECA, oh, we don't have anybody in ECA too, which we young. Um, so um, if there's ever anything we want to bring to ACEs, um, you know, I'm listening to what goes on, voting, you know, as seems appropriate. There's a building project um, that was proposed and actually through um, some interface with the member districts, um, the financing of it was changed so that member districts are not responsible for um, the bonding on that particular project. Um, ACES has the resources to, to do the project. Okay. All right. Um, Kate. Hey you go. Uh, um, okay, some trainings coming up. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned this last time. The CAVE Delegate Assembly is coming up on November 16th. Um, if folks are interested, it's a chance to get together with um, statewide folks from Boards of Ed and debate and vote on four issues and resolutions affecting our district. Um, December 7th is, again, the new Board of Ed member orientation and leadership conference, if folks are interested. Uh, December 14th, the responding to hate incidents in schools and districts. I think that's the one that we've heard of yet, so um, that's an interesting one coming up. Um, as far as 
Cape, uh, the policy highlights um, one thing that I know talking about homework will be at the next meeting. There's an interesting um, piece in, in the uh, October 13th, if folks want to read that. I think Marsha is going to make sure it's attached to the agenda as well. Um, and it's very interesting just talking about teachers' viewpoints and how research may or may not always reflect that. Um, there's some interesting components in that. I don't know how much information to get into now, but we'll just yeah, have it's, to it's as long as we, you don't mention it so. here. Hopefully everybody's reading <laughs> their key things, but um, <coughs> if there's highlights that you think <coughs> makes sense for us all to hear, that's mm -hmm. highlights. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe we'll talk about it at the next policy meeting, and then we could potentially talk about it after that, but I think that'll be a great topic of conversation. Um, October, another piece is October is National Bullying Prevention Month. Um, there's a nice piece on that. Um, and some information on how to uh, stop <coughs> websites and stuff to help have some information to reference on there. Um, and actually the previous one, since there was one every two weeks, uh, the September 29th, also had positive school climate and bullying. And one of the big things they talked about in that, which was very interesting, was just misconceptions of both about bullying and also um, focusing on positive school climate, which I do think Feature tries to do. Um, and that's something to, um, examples would be like launching a kindness campaign um, and stuff like that. So that's an interesting. <coughs> um, one piece that they had sent us, I'm not sure if folks had gotten the email about um, just being conscientious of students that might be coming up from Puerto Rico or the Virgin Islands. I don't know if we have any word of students coming into our district for that. Specific in the VF, we've heard of a few things. I've heard from one parent. Yeah. Possibly. It's an important yeah, area for us to make sure that we can help those in need out there. There's a statewide, uh, there's been a lot of statewide information that you're, that you're really referring to. It's helpful to us, and it makes us uh, ready to create a role. Right. And they also have references. Um, <laughs> that was on October 16th. Multiple references and websites that we can reference questions for that. Um, advocacy highlights. So just if anyone's interested, kind of quick things about things going on with the federal tax reform, how it can affect things. Um, they also have websites that can reference that. So, And then the NSBA <coughs> Advocacy Institute 2018 National Capital Conference. Um, I don't know if folks would be interested in that, but if you're interested in advocacy, there's a lot of interesting things in the highlights. Um, and then, I know they give us lots of things every month. <laughs> the Cave Journal has a lot of different interesting articles. The one thing I just wanted to mention about was um, Bob Rader um, wrote a piece about diversity is what makes us great. Um, and again, with the diversity group and whatnot, there's some um, pieces in here, again, websites that they have for resources, workshops, um, specifically LGBTQ and Muslim, and you know, that, that, those are things that have come up in other meetings that we want to make sure we're um, having our radar and have sensitivities to. Um, so, yeah. That's Thank you. And I think we still just have, we have three of us signed up for the CAVE conference November um, 17th and 18th. Is there three? Yeah, three of us. Barbara yeah. Bob. Okay. Right. Okay. This is the table for a right All right, is there any questions or anything for Megan? No. Nope. Okay. Um, community lecture series, Steve and Nancy. Okay. No, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, no. I'm so sorry. No. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. We're not. We there was community worked. lecture series separate. Right. And there was actually no. Actually, oh, curriculum we skipped. Oh, oh, that was wrong. That, that was wrong. Well, I was going to say something on other. Go for it. That's, that's, my, that's, that's, my, that's, my, that's my fault. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was just. Um, Bob had mentioned the world language presentation that Stephanie Goldberg and Emily Roberts did. I believe that that PowerPoint is um, accessible for any board member who wants to see it. Um, they did a great job and. Um, we did have a discussion at the October 5th meeting also about community
big lecture series, which Nancy and Steve are going to comment on. And our next meeting will be November 9th. It will be in the district office, not in the um, section of the library. And the agenda has switched a bit. We are now going to have a presentation on writer's workshop. So if there's anything that any board member wants to hear about uh, writers, the writer's workshop program, if you would email Bob, is that okay? Mm -hmm. Bob, um, we'll be sure to include that um, at that in that presentation on November 9th. And I just want to quick say on the world language update, one of the things that was very good to hear was the interface with the middle school, not only using the exam results on placement in the middle school, but also the integration of the, um, um, the discussions between our world language teachers and the middle school language staff. So that was great to hear. Can I um, just respectfully request that if anybody has any questions about that or wants to hear certain things about that writer's workshop in that presentation that they do that by this Friday, okay, which great. gives you five days or four more days, so we can make sure there's ample time for that person who's preparing that presentation to take that into account. Okay. okay. Go for it. Um, I mentioned uh, that as the curriculum committee that um, Steve and I had the uh, fun brainstorming um, opportunity to think about this community lecture series um, at venues such as the library or the JCC or other venues in town, really leveraging the um, thought leadership in this town and some of the topics that we came up with, we kind of narrowed it down to three, um, on nutrition um, and uh, choosing foods, maybe combining it with a thought leader at Yale with a restaurateur uh, who's also based in Woodbridge, also sleep and physical activity, maybe more in the winter months, and then maybe in the May as we think about the summertime, screen time and technology some of the impact around that. Um, the goal of this lecture series would be threefold. One is to really provide an outlet for parents and other community members to um, have something that the Board of Ed was sort of sponsoring or organizing um, in a non-feature uh, venue. Two is to provide additional resources that we might not re readily have access to um, as part of community members within the feature system, community. Um, and also three, um, just provide and um, build, build community, uh, leveraging leadership, other venues, and um, um, some of the good topics uh, in town. I think because of the tight schedule in the early part of the year, we were originally thinking of November, and then after presenting it to the curriculum committee, they suggested maybe kicking it off with a January, which would, might go nice with the sleep and physical activity, and then maybe one in the April, May. So I don't know if you want Is there any questions for Nancy or Steve? Okay. All right. Upcoming meeting presentation, strategic plan update. Um, so we will be bringing you at this point in time um, where we are as we move along in um, developing the areas that we presented last year. Um, we would, you know, certain areas are moving, certain initiatives are moving quicker than others based upon just where you are and, and just real life. Um, but we would, we would just sort of an overall 30,000 foot view of that um, for you, unless you have any specific questions or specific requests, you know, project-based learning, enrichment clusters, we started to look a little bit more at curriculum compact and getting ready for those kinds of things. Um, we also certainly have our, some of our committees that we talked about in terms of unification and like, diversity community. Um, so we'll come to you with a, you know, where are we right now, a few more months down the road in this, um, in this journey. So, and, and so I'm assuming you're going to take the strategic plan that we looked at in July, and you're going to be giving us current information on where things are going. The other thing I would ask, in curriculum, we've been, um, Liz's been tracking, you know, what's the cycle for curriculum updates, and, and I know that's a, you know, that's one piece of the strategic plan. Um, but if we could include anything that we've learned already in terms of like what we think the cycles are, if you've got, you know, if we're ready to have, yeah, um, and you know where we're still looking at what we're going to do, that would be helpful to me just to give an idea of, you know, when we look at things again, you know, because um, we're looking at a lot of things. There's a lot of curriculum work going on. It's very impressive um, to hear about. Very, very impressive, and um, I think. Getting an idea of the cycle is helpful for all of us on the board. I didn't have anything else for a strategic. Okay. I feel like 
Paul's just barely in his seat here. <laughs> okay, act on certified staff early retirement incentive. I move that we authorize the superintendent to offer the early retirement incentive to the membership of the WEA. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. Do we have public comment? Can I ask something? Yes. So I know that we talked a little bit about the student council and the drive for the hurricane victims. Just wanted to put kind of in a plug for the big sale that is happening. Um, the hours are Tuesday and Thursday, one to four, one to four during conference time. <coughs> that money that is raised this year will go to pay for the shipping costs for the items that are being sent. So, if anybody you know, wants, if you to have extra bakery, we ran out of brownies. <laughs> <laughs> we would pay for yeah. <laughs> You can be, happily come and pay tomorrow. Okay. Or Thursday. Or next time. Yeah. <laughs> Any other um, public comment? That was the. Sorry. <laughs> you gotta do it. Is that, that was okay. I thought that was for the PT. That's I had fine. decided to, to yeah, speak. Okay. 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 Wait, we might have. Oh. I didn't realize there was a list. Oh. Okay. There is. Okay. Yeah. You can just sign up on the sign public in. comment and then. And then make your comment. And then make your comment. And I don't know. Um, you've been here before, Dan. The yes. public comment, you know, the little blurb. Comment. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dan Esposito, parent of four children here at Beecher. Uh, very pleased with the community that we have and the manner in which we go about educating our kids, as well as protecting them. Um, I've been an outspoken advocate of a school resource officer on the premises in the building whenever the students are here, and I'm glad to see that the committee made a similar recommendation. Um, the school safety plan that was developed in the wake of Sandy Hook obviously included a sworn police officer on the active duty of the bridge. Um, now that the committee has reaffirmed that, I, I think it's very difficult to deviate from that. Um, I think the die has been cast and that economic constraints don't necessarily uh, lead to a defense of liability. So if we've established what's necessary in order to protect our children, and it was developed in the wake of Sandy Hook and now reaffirmed a number of years later, my concern would be the liability that's created and God forbid something were to happen and this plan not be fulfilled. Um, I don't know how we put a price on that, um, but I certainly wouldn't want to be the one explaining to a parent why something happened to their child that could have been avoided had the recommendations of the school safety plan and the ad hoc committee been implemented. Um, I know that cost is certainly a consideration, but I don't know that we can put a price tag on something this important. Um, and if economic considerations are what's going to steer, I encourage the, the board get an estimate of what those litigation costs are, compensatory damages, and potentially punitive damages if it were found to be negligent or reckless in removal of the SRO from the premises. Um, I think the costs would be astronomical and would pale in comparison to what the costs are of the actual SRO position. Um, I know there's been some less expensive options that have been explored. Um, my only issue with that is, is that Active shooters, which is the seems to be the biggest threat these days, turned law enforcement on its head because up until that point, when you had a, a dynamic situation like that, the, the practice was to lock it down, slow things down, and try to negotiate for control back. Active shooters turned that all on its head. They didn't have the luxury of waiting to negotiate. They had to go in and they had to seek out that threat and put themselves in jeopardy in order to do that. And I don't know how you can ask somebody who's not a police officer to fulfill that role, to actually <coughs> confront the threat rather than shelter in place or, or attempt to get people out of harm's way. I really don't think the police are, are the ones who are capable of 
not only understanding that, but dealing with it. Um, and I think that's a very unique situation that us as parents and teachers and administrators are dealing with that in years past me and people. Um, that's it. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Okay. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we'll adjourn. <laughs> Second. All those in favor? Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you everyone here too. Thank you very much. <laughs>